OK, so uh, well, thanks for everyone that's here. And thanks, Derek, for inviting me. It's really a fantastic event. I, and I should have to be a bit ashamed of myself for missing the first half because I had a, a deadline to, to match, unfortunately. But hopefully, uh, I have an a, a interesting talk for you today. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the personal journey of myself, really, working with uh, the people who are helping me to, to, uh, to all the way from um, to naughty development. And I think uh, it's, it's, I'll try to be a, a more of a personal story rather than kind of a scientific talk. So hopefully that's of some interest. Okay, so I'm based in UCL. I think you can probably see it in my biography. Um, so, but, you know, as I mentioned, I will start by it's going beyond DTI, not just in a sense of uh, the scientific development, but also from a personal development, which is I started by working in this very naive illustration of what I think about the, uh, the imaging process analysis work and where I sit at the, at the time. So I was actually in the image analysis domain, which I characterize as developing methods to get more from the data, existing data. So and I worked out things like uh, trying to develop new novel analysis algorithm for registrating diffusion tensor data. That's actually the time where DTI has been around for just about 10 years and a lot of data being collected and then so need to be analyzed. And I think that's what's trying to meet that need. And then subsequently, well, I worked a little bit on analysis such as trying to develop novel track based analysis, which is I think of a lot of interest. So then I was thinking about what I'm gonna do next. And somebody you might know actually came to the lab, visiting the lab I was working in. And he, he was like, oh, actually I actually have this really exciting project that's been starting soon, which is, I think, quite a few of the organizers and those participants are sitting here. And uh, so I was like, wow, that's an amazing opportunity. And, and then he said, you know, there's something this you can do. I said, no, I don't like that. Then he showed me this paper, uh, which has really captured my imagination. The idea that you can actually uh, not taking just the data, but actually thinking about how to design the data. And I think that's the, what this framework's about, trying to take a model that you want to analyze, want to learn about, and design the sequence from that. I think that is something which is this active imaging framework that really is something I like to do. So that's what happened, and I moved on back from image analysis to more of an imaging person, trying to develop models that define the data for the future. So, so the starting point is what Danny did. Uh, he's uh, ActiveX, which is really, I think, the short for active imaging for X caliber. Start by a very simplified model, the tissue model, uh, which is simplified charmed version, and which you heard about this morning. And then come up with the optimization framework used active imaging to design the sequence, which you see on the right. And then at the bottom in the middle shows you the result, which is the first in vivo illustration of what we can do with diffusion to look at axe caliber. And then all the way move to the bottom, bottom left is a result. Okay, so that's very exciting. And what you see there, you see a little bit of a, let me just zoom in perhaps. Um, what you see, if I pick one of the pictures, the, the crosses are the histology measure. And the lines of various forms are come from the measure data from diffusion using the axe active axe. And you can see that even though the trend is well captured, uh, by, the, uh, by the measurement from MRI. But there's a quite evident overestimation. So that's a problem which is I was asked to, to try to address. And the, the intuition that Danny came up was, you know, actually the things are not really parallel. That's one of the condition underlying child model initially. And so if they are dispersed, as you see uh, on the right, you can see that their cross section is actually fatter. It means that you get bigger estimates. So, so I think that's one of the source of getting these overestimation. To fix it, we need to try to account for that orientation dispersion. So that's what I, what I worked on. And uh, so I used uh, what's known as a Watson model. It's a very simple analytic model to do that. And it's, uh, it turns out to be a technical challenge, which is the idea is actually being around for a long time. But the problem is, if you do it in a straightforward way, you end up with a thousand times longer processing. <coughs> from one second to do one voxel, one second is a long time. One second you can do a whole DTI fit, but anyway, one second for one voxel then. But with Watson model, straightforward fit is a thousand seconds. So we can't afford to do that. So that's when I worked out some mathematics and wrote loads of code, or actually a little bit longer, 
and uh, to reduce that to three seconds. So that, that was the contribution, I think. It's a technical contribution which allows us to embed this simple model into the system so we can actually capture the orientation dispersion in a very efficient way. So the result actually is quite nice. And uh, on the left shows the simulation. You can see for different kappa. Kappa is representing the concentration. So bigger, the more concentrated. Smaller, the more dispersed. So as, as kappa is low at four level, the slower level we tested, you get a very high value of overestimation. But as kappa goes down, as we expected, you get a lower overestimation. And we see that exactly replicated in the in vivo data, where you see a quite clear change where the regions with low dispersion, you end up with very little uh, uh, overestimation. So that's really nice. But there's still a problem. So there is a very marginal reduction in the overestimation. We haven't really solved the problem. And of course, that was 2011. And I think now I know, and I think a lot of people in the field has been working on that problem. We realize we need stronger gradients. We need to perhaps model the axonal undulation. And perhaps we need to account for the extra axonal time dependence. So there's a range of things that we can do. But that's now. You know, We learned a lot since that uh, time. So back to 2011, I really can't gaze into a you know, crystal ball. So I gazed into my data. So I looked at the actual map on the left, you see. Now look at what's on the right. Actually, going back and look at Danny's paper carefully, I say, how did he compute those values? OK, so I draw your attention to that passage. So those final parameters estimates come from the mean over the MCMC samples. So on the bottom shows you what those samples might look like. This is not from our data. I just have to grab something from the internet because of short notice. But nevertheless, you can see that they are, they are starting from 0 and waving a lot. It really basically says we can't determine it. OK, overestimation really is a genuine reflection of the lack of ability to determine the measure, not necessarily overestimation. That's just simply a reflection of the uncertainty. So that made me think, why don't we fix it? Yeah, it's worth a try. So this is what I did. I, I fixed it with to some very small value, 0, for example. And I computed other parameters. So the, the, the fit for axon diameter, this, so this is, again, our, our, our illustrative figure. So the point is I computed some parameters that I, we could have computed with axon diameter fixed to 0, like, say, volume fraction. And the correlation is 0.989, or anything like that order, meaning actually the data can be explained so well by not accounting for axon diameter, despite the fact that the protocol that design actually has time dependence, meaning that we have different diffusion time. So that's really interesting. That suggests that there's very little information in the data that actually explains the dependency of axon diameter. So there you go. And that's one thing that kind of hit me. At the same time, I was being reading this paper, which is you already heard from SUNY just this morning. And I think that inspired sort of where I'm going. The, the idea to actually be able to measure dendritic density is very compelling. And I think gray matter is a really important thing to look at. And in a series of work, as you heard this morning, um, he showed that you know, not only we can model it, we can actually try to get some sensible number. So that was like, oh, I got to do that. And I think the, uh, the opportunity arises then. So I came out with the Naughty, actually not, not, not too soon. That's after a few. One day I woke up, actually I have to swap those two things, if I can see. The swap that actually gave me the name. So that was uh, a little uh, magic. So, so the way, as I said, that Naughty is designed, or I, when I think about it, is really trying to address a single problem. I want to, hope to, uh, to bring the microstructure imaging to the clinic. You know, obviously, I think you know, we will know now that it's difficult. But nevertheless, that was my aspiration. I would like to be able to do something beyond DTI that can learn more about the microstructure that covers both gray and white matter. So the strategy is very simple. We start with a simple model, which is, I think, that's just a more, more graphical illustration of what you heard this morning from Chang. We divide the signal into three compartments from intra space, extra space, to the CSF space. Yeah? And for these spaces, we can model them distinctly, like you heard. But the, the main distinction here is the intra space captured dispersion. And the diffusion tensor space also captured dispersion. And finally, on the right shows you the set of parameters we can produce from this model. They're rather straightforward to understand, free water fraction, how much CSF uh, partial volume you have. And your density index tells you a sense of 
the, the packing density or, uh, or an orientation dispersion tells you how things are dispersed. So that's kind of a very simple model we're aiming for. So the second step is to use active imaging to design a very simple uh, acquisition. And I think that's, again, I, I replace the, 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 the parallel sticks with this naughty model and go through the active imaging framework uh, as implemented by Danny. And we led to, that led to the simple sequence, which is a composed of two different B values. And uh, so that is something much more manageable. So we're going from a 60 minute scan, which is we did for the active acts, which only cover about maybe 50% of the brain, to something we can cover whole brain about, at the time, 30 minutes. But now we can do it well within 10, 15 minutes with multi-bands. Okay. So now the results, and, and actually I, I, I call myself very lucky with the help of Torben Schneider working with Claudia wheeler Kingshot, uh, We were able to just first go, we got some data, we run it, actually just sort of worked. And we get at least nice map to look at. You know, doesn't mean they're right, but they're sort of nice map to look at. And what you get is a comparison here showing the DTI parameters, FA, versus a naughty parameters. And you can see the, 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 what I call the disentanglement of the microstructure factors that contribute to FA. Uh, in this example, probably the better, you can see that uh, what I have is a color-coded uh, color scatter plot. Each point in that plot representing the uh, value of orientation dispersion of neural density of a particular voxel in the brain. And then they're colored by the corresponding FA values. So you can see that for colored green, for example, they can have essentially the same FA, but a very distinct neural density and orientation dispersion. So that's really the goal. And I think you know, in some way you achieve that. And I think you know, it's, uh, the community responded quite well. Um, and they, they were looking at various uh, applications as well as various uh, microstructures. And I'm not going to spend the time on any of them. I will quickly look at some of the recent development, which is including, I think, a few people here are really contributing to that. So start with uh, Alex, uh, Alex, uh, Alexandro Daducci's uh, Amico method really transformed uh, the practical utility of Naughty from something which is at the moment, like I said, takes uh, three seconds to fit one voxel, actually maybe fit a faster, uh, three seconds for active X version. But nevertheless, it takes 40 hours to actually fit, say, or 50 hours to fit a whole brain, and now you can do it in five, 10 minutes. That's remarkable, and that's very, very beneficial for the users. And then the second thing that uh, my group, uh, one of my uh, first students, which is uh, Mar uh, uh, Mara Tarek, which has developed an an extension of the Naughty try to account for the bending and fanning of the fiber where the original Naughty doesn't account for. And uh, recently, there are even more excitement, uh, which is from uh, Farouk et al. published a crossing version of Naughty, which is actually I've been trying to do, but uh, really haven't found the time. And that was, that was showing some really interesting results. And finally, I think uh, in the post of uh, Oro Gosh, working with me and Danny, and, and look at a one very interesting question, you know, are the brain occupied by crossing or dispersion? And I think uh, the results are very, very interesting and there's stirred some discussion in the community and I think we found a, a evidence in using very high quality HCP data that the most of the brain, or I think actually most of the brain, actually is dispersion. So in other words, that you know, the, the traditional view of that things are crossing perhaps is oversimplistic. And uh, we, 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 we heard some feedback at the various meetings, and I think Oro recently updated the model to making sure that we can account for dispersion even in a single fiber, and the results uh, actually turned out to be more or less the same. So that's actually a very interesting scientific uh, uh, finding from the development. And with that, and I think I'm going to just thank the people that I've been working with, people at Microstructure Imaging, which is part of the, the CMIX, Central Imaging, and a few, you can see you probably meet a few of them here. And Iowen and my collaborator, I, I don't have time to discuss some of their uh, clinical applications, but yeah, I thank them for working with me and showing the value of Naughty and the funding body. Then there's a, a good picture from the mix. And uh, there's also some of the, uh, the logos of the software that we, uh, we provide available for everyone to look at. And I think one of the philosophy, I have, I guess, 10 seconds for me. Is that right? No, fine. Ah, fine. OK, then I'm going very fast. Great. So no, I think we're going to. Yes, that's fine. So, um, and so in the end, I think uh, one of the things I want, just want to say is I think one of the philosophy that uh, the, the Danny's group, and uh, something what I do as well, is uh, when we're looking at a computational science, that's what we do. We model everything is computational. Computational science, when you publish a paper, it's not a publication of the work. It's an advertisement of the work. 
because without the code behind it, without the script behind it, without those to reproducing the result, they're just advertisement. They're not the publication. So I think the philosophy of the group, philosophy of actually Danny's work, he, he published all the code, all the data, that behind every figure that he produced them. I think that is something which I think, you know, the, uh, there's definitely more traction in the community, and I think that is something which I do, I uh, think we should all embrace. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gary. Um, we have time for some questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I would just like to say that I, for my PhD pro thesis, I programmed some software. It's called the Maastricht Diffusion Toolbox. And we implemented the Noddy model, the Charm model, the Tensor model, the Ballstick model, most of the models that are currently actually found in um, the literature. It was just slightly advertising my toolbox, of course. I uh, also like to mention that we made it GPU accelerated. So it's like it can calculate Noddy on this example toolbox in about 30 seconds, which makes it, I think, Fantastic. feasible for um, population studies. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the contribution. So. Um, other questions? I just wanted to be a bit um, provocative here, but <laughs> obviously you've stated very clearly that uh, your aim with Noddy was to develop uh, something that was usable at clinical level. So uh, obviously that comes at a price because in order to get something that is short in terms of scan time, you have to make a lot of assumptions and a lot of simplifications. Absolutely, yeah. um, to what extent do you think that is going to really impact the results that we get? I mean, can we really call the maps that we get? You know, can we say that's really the intracellular volume rather than you know, the other parameters and so on? And that's, that's a very important question. And I think the, um, uh, the my view of it is I see it as trying to do quantitative microsurgery imaging as an aspiration. And I think it guided how we design the model, how we think about the problem. But I think you do have to accept the fact that we're not going to go there in a straight line. And I think the diffusion, we're a diffusion community. We know tortuosity very well. And I think science is like that. And I think perhaps with a bit of a positive flow to progress over time. But nevertheless, it's a torturous process. And we learn from what we do. We learn from our mistake. And I think I would have uh, uh, missed to mention that. I think you will hear from today's talk, uh, I think Philip's talk, which will talk about some, I think, exciting things about new data. I think the data is the, the king. Yeah, we listen to data. We are scientists. So when we have new data, when we model cannot fit, the existing model cannot fit, then we know we're absolutely wrong. And I think before that, I think it's a more of a debate. I think, you know, I think that is a very valuable a contribution, and I look forward to hear that. Any more questions? I think Ben. Oh, sorry. Maybe you'd love to sh shout, but. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi, Gary. That was a great talk. Um, obviously, one of the main motivations for this kind of work is developing biomarkers for the brain. Um, with that in mind, how important do you think it is that these uh, parameters have to exactly correspond to the uh, microstructure of the tissue? Um, and in some cases, do you think it's not enough that they could just correlate? As long as you know they're not cross-correlating with other parameters, can they still be useful as biomarkers? Yeah, no, that's, that's another important question. I think uh, I, I do a lot of work with clinicians trying to develop biomarkers using techniques like Naughty and other diffusion techniques. And I think uh, from a purely utilitarian point of view, or if you think about what is a metric to, uh, to demonstrate whether a biomarker succeeded or failed, I think the correlation or the prediction of, say, disease states, or the progression of the disease, I think that is essential. I think that is a metric. Not necessarily, it's great to know that it, it exactly reflects underlying truth, but I think that's not the necessary condition for a biomarker to succeed. But having said that, I think having knowing that your model actually has some sense. It, it helps you interpret. And I think it will give you 
a better, I think, have a better face in terms of, of a chance of getting something that is more likely to reflect the underlying process. I think, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a, uh, I think the, the, the merit in trying to, uh, to approach this problem in a, just a diverse way. You know, I think it's not something we can debate philosophically, but I think in practice, I think clinicians, they're looking for, they want help. They want something that works, no matter how. I think we just have to try to do it. Okay.